Chapter 14 First Vision of Joseph Smith, Sr. The Box Second Vision The Tree and the Spacious Building After selling the farm at Tunbridge, we moved only a short distance to the town of Royalton. Here we resided a few months, then moved again to Sharon, Windsor County, Vermont. In the latter place, my husband rented a farm of my father, which he cultivated in the summer, teaching school in the winter. In this way, my husband continued laboring for a few years, during which time our circumstances gradually improved until we found ourselves quite comfortable again. In the meantime, we had a son whom we called Joseph, after the name of his father. He was born December 23, 1805. I shall speak of him more particularly by and by. We moved thence to Tunbridge. Here we had another son whom we named Samuel Harrison, born March 13, 1808. We lived in this place a short time, then moved to Royalton, where Ephraim was born, March 13, 1810. We continued here until we had another son, born March 13, 1811, whom we called William. About this time my husband's mind became much excited upon the subject of religion, he would not subscribe to any particular system of faith, but contended for the ancient order, as established by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his apostles. One night my husband retired to his bed in a very thoughtful state of mind, contemplating the situation of the Christian religion, or the confusion and discord that were extant. He soon fell into a sleep, and before waking had the following vision, which I shall relate in his own words, just as he told it to me the next morning. I seemed to be traveling in an open, barren field, and as I was traveling, I turned my eyes towards the east, the west, the north, and the south, but could see nothing save dead, fallen timber. Not a vestige of life, either animal or vegetable, could be seen. Besides, to render the scene still more dreary, the most death-like silence prevailed. No sound of anything animate could be heard in all the field. I was alone in this gloomy desert, with the exception of an attendant spirit, who kept constantly by my side. Of him I inquired the meaning of what I saw, and why I was thus traveling in such a dismal place. He answered thus, This field is the world, which now lieth inanimate and dumb, in regard to the true religion or plan of salvation. But travel on, and by the wayside you will find on a certain log a box, the contents of which, if you eat thereof, will make you wise, and give unto you wisdom and understanding. I carefully observed what was told me by my guide, and proceeding a short distance I came to the box. I immediately took it up and placed it under my left arm. Then with eagerness I raised the lid and began to taste of its contents, upon which all manner of beasts, horned cattle, and roaring animals rose up on every side in the most threatening manner possible, tearing the earth, tossing their horns, and bellowing most terrifically all around me, and they finally came so close upon me that I was compelled to drop the box and fly for my life. Yet in the midst of all this I was perfectly happy, though I awoke trembling." From this forward, my husband seemed more confirmed than ever in the opinion that there was no order or class of religionists that knew any more concerning the kingdom of God than those of the world, or such as made no profession of religion whatever. In 1811, we moved from Royalton, Vermont, to the town of Lebanon, New Hampshire. Soon after arriving here, my husband received another very singular vision, which I will relate. I thought, said he, I was traveling in an open, desolate field, which appeared to be very barren. As I was thus traveling, the thought suddenly came into my mind that I had better stop and reflect upon what I was doing before I went any further. So I asked myself, What can I have in tr what motive can I have in traveling here, and what place can this be? My guide, who was by my side as before, said, this is the desolate world, but travel on. The road was so broad and barren that I wondered why I should travel in it. For said I to myself, Broad is the road and wide is the gate that leads to death, 
and many there be that walk therein. But narrow is the way, and straight is the gate that leads to everlasting life, and few there be that go in thereat. Traveling a short distance further, I came to a narrow path. This path I entered, and when I had traveled a little way in it, I beheld a beautiful stream of water which ran from the east to the west. Of this stream I could see neither the source nor yet the mouth, but as far as my eyes could extend, I could see a rope running along the bank of it, about as high as a man could reach, and beyond me was a low but very pleasant valley in which stood a tree such as I had never seen before. It was exceedingly handsome, insomuch that I looked upon it with wonder and admiration. Its beautiful branches spread themselves somewhat like an umbrella, and it bore a kind of fruit, in shape much like a chestnut burr, and as white as snow, or if possible, whiter. I gazed upon the same with considerable interest, and as I was doing so the burrs, or shells, commenced opening and shedding their particles, or the fruit which they contained, which was of dazzling whiteness. I drew near, and began to eat of it, and I found it delicious beyond description. As I was eating, I said in my heart, I cannot eat this alone. I must bring my wife and children, that they may partake with me. Accordingly, I went and brought my family, which consisted of a wife and seven children, and we all commenced eating and praising God for this blessing. We were exceedingly happy, insomuch that our joy could not easily be expressed. While thus engaged, I beheld a spacious building standing opposite the valley which we were in, and it appeared to reach to the very heavens. It was full of doors and windows, and they were all filled with people who were very finely dressed. When these people observed us in the low valley under the tree, they pointed the finger of scorn at us, and treated us with all manner of disrespect and contempt. But their contempt we utterly disregarded. I presently turned to my guide and inquired of him the meaning of the fruit that was so delicious. He told me it was the pure love of God, shed abroad in the hearts of all those who love him and keep his commandments. He then commanded me to go and bring the rest of my children. I told him that we were all there. No, he replied, look yonder. You have two more, and you must bring them also. Upon raising my eyes, I saw two small children standing some distance off. I immediately went to them and brought them to the tree, upon which they commenced eating with the rest, and we all rejoiced together. The more we ate, the more we seemed to desire until we even got down upon our knees and scooped it up, eating it by double handfuls. After feasting in this manner a short time, I asked my guide what was the meaning of the spacious building which I saw. He replied, It is Babylon, it is Babylon, and it must fall. The people in the doors and windows are the inhabitants thereof, who scorn and despise the saints of God because of their humility. I soon awoke, clapping my hands together for joy 